Welcome to the UCSC Emeriti Group's Emeriti Lecture. Tonight presented by David Cope, Emeritus, Emeritus Professor of Music. I'm Melanie Mayer, Chairperson of the Emeriti Group. And tonight we continue our tradition of offering to the UCSC and Santa Cruz communities occasional lectures of distinction by distinguished Emeriti faculty. We, appreci we appreciate Chancellor Blumenthal's support for this endeavor. When I contacted David this summer about giving this lecture, I told him about the Cabrillo Festival's world premiere per performance of Kevin Putz's Symphony No. 4. This work was commissioned especially to highlight the history and musical traditions of the San Juan Batista mission. In his research of background for the symphony, composer Putz learned of the Matsun Indians who came under the influence of the mission, but who continued to sing and play their own music. In the Bancroft Library, Putz found a manuscript containing transcriptions from about 1818 of a few Matsun songs, and he thought to include these themes in his composition. But when he consulted a leader of the Matsuns who still remain in the San Juan Batista area, Putz learned that the songs were sacred, that if he were to use them, they would cause sickness for the Matsun. So Putz says he decided he would, quote, try to imitate the flavor and nuance of the Matsun music, but avoid direct quotation. As I listened to Kevin Putz's interesting solutions to the challenge, I nevertheless couldn't help but wonder what David Cope and Emmy would have come up with had they undertaken the same task. David Cope is a world-renowned composer and an author of many books on music theory and composition. He's received many awards from prestigious groups such as the National Endowment for the Arts, ASCAP Standard Panel, the Composers Forum of New York City, and, then, and the Houston Composers Symposium. And he has over 70 published compositions. David is also the creator of a computer program called Experiments in Musical Intelligence, affectionately called Emmy. Emmy analyzes a particular composer's style then generates new music in that style. Emmy and David have been prolific. They've created over 6,000 compositions together. In response to my wondering about Emmy's solution to devising a Matsun-like composition, David agreed for tonight to explain why he created Emmy and why the program works as it does. He will also tell us why he now has turned to quite different but related research. David Cope's work is an adventure in artificial intelligence and creativity, as well as in music. Tonight, in addition to an introduction to Emmy, he will also treat us to a musical Turing test, an on-the-spot computer composition, live performances, and if that's not enough, we're going to hear a world premiere of a new work. We are very pleased to present David Cope's Emeriti Lecture, Why Experiments in Musical Intelligence. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Melanie for that very fine introduction. I'd like to thank the Emeriti Group for inviting me to present uh, this lecture, although I must say my last lecture was to my last child before he left home. I don't generally give lectures. As you can tell already, I like to talk to people about what I, I know or what I think I know and look them directly into the eyes and so forth, so you'll not see me reading anything tonight except off the screen that's behind me. 
So I won't lecture to you in any way, shape, or form, although that damn light up there is so bright that I'm going to have to sort of squint to see you out there, but I'm going to do my best to look every one of you in the eye at least once tonight and see if I can do that. I've already started working at it. Okay, why experiments in musical intelligence? Um, not only was correct, this does, this, this program has uh, a feminine name, and it's not EMI, it's EMMY, because I think of this program, I anthropomorphize this program in many ways, as you can imagine. I began this program in 1980, as I'll describe shortly, and it's been with me for the last 27 years in one form or another. It's a kind of a moving target. It does change a lot. So, you know, it's, um, it's a funny business I'm in. But I do believe in, in truth and advertising. So as Melanie told you, I am going to try to do all these things in the next hour or so, get you home early so you can do whatever you need to do uh, before you go to bed tonight. So take a look at this. We're going to try to get through it all in one form or another, and I'll do it without speaking, I hope, too loudly at you or go too fast. So we begin. Why I created the program? Well, it says in front of you there, Composer's Block. In 1980, I did have a Composer's Block. I had, in fact, an opera commission, um, and the money was given up front, which is a little unusual, but I had four children at the time, four boys, in the deep, dark hole of teenage years, living in a 1,400-square-foot house. You can imagine. Some of you can imagine. Maybe not all of you can imagine, but it was quite a scene. And it was really nice to have that money. In fact, I spent that money quite readily uh, the minute I got it, which put me in a rather disadvantageous position. I couldn't get a composer's block, and I'm sure that's exactly why I got a composer's block, okay? Because essentially I knew that I couldn't get one. And so I, I started working on this opera. For the first time in my life, I had this problem. To me, C-sharp and C, I didn't know. All the pitches sort of sounded the same. Of course, they were higher and lower than one another, as we talk about on in terms of pitch, but nonetheless, no pitch, no set of intervals seem to attract me in any way, shape, or form. And I'm sure all of you have had a similar block in terms of uh, writer's block or cooking block or a life block, what have you. And so I think you know what I was going through. It was a trauma, but most severe was the fact that I had this opera commission looming over me, and I had no idea how I was going to begin it. So to make a long story short, I decided that I was going to hopefully develop a computer program that while I knew at that point in my life that this program wouldn't actually produce any sounds that would interest me in, in any way, shape, or form, they might act as a foil, a target, something that would, would provoke me to write something good. In other words, it would produce a sound and I'd say, oh God, that's awful. I wouldn't do that. I would do this and I'd be off and running. So that was the initial point at which I started because I didn't believe at that time that any computer music would sound worthwhile in any degree and that I was still going to be going back and writing my piece by hand. Uh, it was never my desire, or it may have been my desire, but it was never my intention to write even a note of the actual resultant composition uh, by computer. And this is again 1980. Now, I knew computers didn't make sounds, and just to get you familiar with how things worked in those days, I was working off the PDP-10 computer that was at the computer center here on campus with a modem and a, a, a computer, a terminal really, not a computer, in my, in my garage, essentially sitting out there on cold nights, communicating very slowly with this computer, running programs that produced out produced for me large reams of numbers, which I would then translate the notes, run into the house and play on the piano, or sing, which I'd like to do as well, and so that I could hear this music. It was a pretty, uh, uh, you know, very time-consuming process, but it worked. And as you will soon see, the first things that came out of this were pretty rudimentary. But it wasn't before long that actually I had, as you can see behind me here, some encouraging results. And so the next thing I'd like to do is show you some of those results or let you hear them. And I'd like to do so in what we lovingly call a musical Turing test. Now this is, for those of you who know about Turing tests, this is not a real Turing test. It's sort of a kind of a fake fun Turing test. We're going to play live for you right now three pieces of music. One or more of these pieces is in the style or written by, I should say, Frederick Chopin, Mazurka. And one or more of these pieces is written by Emmy. 
in the style of Chopin. Now, I'm going to make you really listen closely to this Turing test because I'm going to ask for a show of hands at the end to vote for whether you think it's one or the other. And I'm going to take a rough tabulation and see what we come up against. Now, for those of you who might know the one or more Chopin mazurkas that will be played now, I ask you to disqualify yourself because that's unfair. If you know the piece already, then it's no good. Okay, so I want you just to refrain from voting. But most of you, I think, won't know. He wrote roughly 56 mazurkas. That's a lot of them to know. And I've gone through and, and selected one or, one or two of these, not three. Couldn't be three because I haven't fooled you. One of these, at least, is Emmy. One of these is at least Chopin. I've even um, mixed these up. I've shuffled them. So the pianist who's going to play, the, play these, uh, who will come up right now, Anatole Lakin, a uh, dear colleague of mine, a dear friend of mine, and a fantastic pianist, and a Chopin expert, believe me. He's written uh, a series of editions for uh, Peters Corporation, New York City, major publisher of Chopin's music in this country, and he's going to play them as I give them to him, and then I take a vote in between. So, Anatole, welcome. <laughs> Let's give him a hand before he plays. <laughs> Now, for those, before we take the vote, now for those who, who really may not have much experience with Chopin mazurkas, I would ask that you vote for the piece that you think, whether that was written by a human being or not. Let's just put it that way. So there may be some students in here who are not aware enough of Chopin to know, did that sound like it was a human or a machine? And I'm going to do the votes in between each one just to get a feel for it. And I want you to Vote one way or the other. You know, we're not going to take two votes here. We're just going to take one. I'm just going to ask the simple question. How many thought that that particular mazurka was composed by Chopin? And before you raise your hand and I take this rough poll, I want you to make sure it really counts. You're going to really think about this. Okay? I shuffled these things up. How many think that that piece was written by... Hmm? You're not voting. No, 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 no. <laughs> So, 
Raise your hand. Nobody thought that was. Now, wait a minute now. This is ridiculous. Okay, raise, raise them higher. What's the what? How many feel that that piece was written by, composed by, Frederick Chopin? That's the question. Okay, real high. Okay, we got about a quarter of the group. This is a low score. Okay, so about a quarter of the group. Okay. Same question. How many people feel that particular mazurka kind of thing was? Remember, you can't vote in either case if you feel like you may know the piece itself. Was created or composed by Chopin. Okay, a little bit more. Looks like about... I'm closing in on half. Let's say half. Okay? All right. Number three. Remember your votes.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last time for a vote. How many felt that that was composed by Chopin? Raise your hand. Well, that's close to still a little bit less than half. I'd say 40%, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, anybody want to change your votes now that you've got the context of having an opportunity to, uh, to listen to all three? How many still stick with your votes for number one? Again. Let's see it. Even less, it looks like. But that's it, okay? Number two, anybody want to change your mind for that? Who? No, 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 no. Let's hear it. Vote. All right, right. Your vote for number two. Oh, my. Well, that's a little less than half now, too. That's about 40%. Some people change their mind. How about number three? That's pretty good. That's about 40% still. So we've got kind of a tie here. Huh. You think I should tell them what's, what's the score is, or let's just let them hang? <laughs> Do you want to know? <laughs> okay. The first one was by Emmy. Okay, you got it right. I made you change your minds, though. The second one, a little bit, the second one, which pretty closely tied the third one, was by Chopin. So those of you who felt pretty good. I'm proud of you. And the third one was by Emmy again. Emmy was sandwiching Chopin, in this case, on the outer bounds. Now, I was rooting for you. I mean, most people think that I'm up here rooting for Emmy to win this contest. I'm really not. I'm hoping that a lot of people are more familiar with, with Chopin's mazurka style than, than we think they are and can actually tell the difference because there's always a difference to be told. Um, but I hope I'm also convincing you that at this early stage of the career, these were written some time ago, that you might get to believe that they're not so far off, even though you may recognize the difference. They all sound com human composed, at least in some way. And so you can understand why the point here, not only to give you the Curing test and make you feel good about your choices, but, but also that I was encouraged by the results. Okay, so that's the point. And I thank Anatole again for, for uh, for helping us uh, prove it to a degree. <laughs> now I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes explaining how it works, but I'm not going to explain it in great detail. There's some things like musical form and other things that I'm not going to go into. It would take too long, and an hour presentation is not going to afford us that amount of time. But if you put up with me for a second, I'm going to show you particularly how chronologically this program worked in the coding form. So, here we go with, with the first output of this program, Kirka 1982. This is a Bach chorale now, a different form of music. I decided when I early on that I was going to choose a number of composers and really settle on them. And those composers in particular were Bach, Chopin, Mozart, and for reasons I'll go into later, Rachmaninoff. Okay? And those are the four that I sort of focused on. And I think I was pretty successful, or Emmy was, in terms of three of those, at least initially. And then the fourth one, Rock Mononoff, took a lot longer, and there's still some question in some people's mind about how successful it was or not. But we're going to use for demonstration here an old Bach chorale technique. Bach wrote a lot of chorales, closing in on 400 of these things, and if you include the cantatas, the ones that aren't in the uh, Riemenschneider book from which these are taken, there could be up to 500 separate chorales that he wrote. A lot of literature to work from. And in any event, I wrote a first program following what is often called an expert system or a rules-based program uh, to compose in this style. And by that I mean I had taught the rudiments of Bach chorales and music theory for you know, dozens of years, decades prior to this, and felt I knew the rules pretty well. And so I just coded those rules into a program and simply had that program create music. It took me a year to produce this particular piece and others like it, and it took me a year because a lot of those rules are competing with one another. In certain circumstances, one rule will outdo the other one. In other circumstances, the other rule will win. And so it's very difficult to weight the rules in such a way that you can actually produce decent sounding music. But when this came out, a year after I started in 1983 or so, maybe 1982 late, 
uh, I was pretty proud of it. Now, you're going to hear it played on a very static computer uh, performance, which is very rigid and mechanical in its performance. But it'll give you an idea of how I felt at that time, because that's actually at the time there wasn't still computers weren't making music, but that's probably how I played it on the piano anyway. And this is fake voices, so that's going to be bad. So just sort of bear with me. We're going to get to some prettier performances later on. But this is not what you just heard. This is fake voices. There's no text at all. <laughs> thought that was pretty swell. <laughs> you know, I played that. I don't know if I had my family sing it with me or whatever, but, you know, it turned out pretty darn well, I thought. It follows most of the rules of a Bach chorale, and you, can, you can't find the usual things that, you know, uh, freshmen and sophomore students write in their Bach chorale imitations uh, because they aren't here. And they won't be. And there's suspensions and some other things. But you can tell, I'm sure, most of you, that that doesn't sound much like Bach. It sounds like vanilla, you know, part writing from the Baroque period. But it sounds, I would give this probably a B in a late freshman course. It wasn't very good in the long run. But worse than that, I had discovered in one fell swoop that how my, my programming skills had improved and I was able to produce this nice program that produced Bach chorales that I was nowhere closer to, to doing what I really wanted to do, which was create something that would actually, you know, be a foil for me, as I described earlier, in composing my Cope opera. In fact, my opera commissioner was getting rather upset with me at this point that I hadn't produced any notes that he could hear in the music. But I dismissed that and I convinced him that what I was working on was going to change the world and it was going to make the best opera anybody's ever heard, and I can get pretty intense when I say these things, and therefore I convinced him that that was the case. <laughs> I didn't know what I was talking about, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I was, at that point in my career, I guess I could have sold a refrigerator to an Eskimo or whatever, but anyway, it felt good. <laughs> but I had a problem. The problem was that, you know, all this thing did was churn out vanilla Bach Corral-like thing over and over and over again. And I was no closer to that, to that solution that I wanted for my opera. It was not making me look at this thing because it wasn't in my style. It wasn't anything close to me, but it, it was, you know, something that I could feel good about. So I took long walks, and one day I actually had an epiphany. And the epiphany came in the following form. What I need is a program that, in fact, works with a database of music by a given composer. And that program, a small program, not a program built with rules that I've devised for figuring out how a composer works, but actually analyzes the rules of the composer that has composed that body of music and then attempt, in fact, to compose a new piece in a style similar to those composers, but not duplicating any one of the pieces that's in the database. And I hope you followed all of that because it's a mouthful. In any event, I'm going to show you how I went about doing this. It seemed like a really neat idea. And so what we're going to do is I started off with a, an actual Bach chorale, which I'm happy to say for you right now sounds pretty much as bad as the one I just played for you because of those damnable voices and that machine-like performance. So we've had the luxury so far of the beautiful performances of Anatole uh, giving you nuances and not this strict stuff. So. Uh, this is going to sound pretty bad too, but it's going to still sound better, I would say. Here's the Bach uh, chorale number 237. Is that what it says? Cope, get your glasses out. Is that what it says? Good. I'm glad to see it, but I still need my glasses. Okay. Here we go, if I can find my pointer. And here's how this one sounds. <laughs> Okay, now if I can find my pointer, which I, oh, it's in my hand, I'm going to try to show you the idea that I had. Let's see if it works. It does. How about that? Okay. Here was my idea. I wanted to take parts, pieces and parts of the actual Bach and put them together in new ways so that even Bach wouldn't recognize this new composition, but it would follow all the rules of Bach's composition. So I know you're not all musicians, but I think you can follow what I'm about ready to say. This program I devised took this first beat and stored it. You notice it's in C major, there's no key signature here. And stored it and said, okay, look, 
I've got these notes on the downbeat, this note on the offbeat, and I want you to remember that the chord that follows you has these notes in it. Then do the same thing to this chord, the same thing to this chord, the same thing to this chord, and keep on doing that to all the chords in all 371 Bach chorales, which I put in by hand, five numbers for each note. Now you can pull them off the network and, you know, simply, you know, the internet and just get them right. But that, in those days, you had to do that. But I'm nothing if not stubborn, and so I stubbornly did it. Uh, it took a while. I learned a lot more about Bach chorales. I'm even, even the world's expert on these damn things. Not that anybody would care, but in any event, in any event, I did this. Now, what you're going to be surprised about is that with all those chorales, by the way, they're all transposed to the key of C. That's something I could do since I was putting all these numbers in, since they're all in the key of C, that there's going to be more chords than just this one that start like this, and more chords than this one. They'll be all over the place. In other words, duplicate chords. Now, what's fascinating about this is these other chords may go to some other chord here. And so the minute you take this chord, start the piece, and look around for any other chord that happens to have those notes as a downbeat, then use that chord. That chord will tie into another chord here, and that chord will tie into another chord. And by that stitching mechanism, that recombinancy, I call it, you're going to be able to create an interesting new Bach chorale. Now, if you don't believe it, we're going to put one together right in front of your eyes, as long as you understand the principles involved. We're going to use this one to start with. Okay? So the very next thing I'm going to show you is this beat, followed by precisely this bead here, okay? But this bead here is going to actually be found in a different Bach chorale. There are, after all, only so many places you can put the notes that make sense in this style. So let's go on and look at it. And sure enough, you can see that our first beat of, of 327 here goes to this one. But if you remember that one, it kept going down in eighth notes. This actual beat was found in a different measure in Bach 223. And it goes quite in a different place. So if you listen to that now, you'll see that we already have a new Bach chorale part that Bach never wrote, although he wrote all these notes. Now, of course, Bach sometimes didn't give us choices, well, especially when we had things, things called suspensions. So you're going to find that there's some pieces of code here, some some pieces of music, some parts of music that have to be taken more than a beat at a time. So you're going to see it's going to bump and sort of grind its way through phrases. But I want you to listen to these as we go through it. And we'll go through it quickly because it'll be the same chorale. Now we've got two, but notice there's some, some extra baggage. There's more of 223 than there was before. This sounds like this. <laughs> This one sounds like this, adding a new This one sounds like this. It's extending the same phrase. I'm sure you're getting tired of that, but one more time. Because here it is, the whole phrase, not by Bach but by Bach. Now, this time I was really thrilled because there was almost no code, almost no programming. The program doesn't know whether it's doing Bach or whether it's doing menus for tonight's dinner recipes, but it's able to piece these things together out of little parts that make sense. Now, if you think this isn't any big deal, it is, because if you take any, you know, two chords of Bach chorales at random, they'll make no sense whatsoever. This has to be done very sensitively. There are problems, of course, and the problems are this. There's no sense of form or shape or balance of phrase lengths. So some phrases will last two beats. Body. 
And some phrases will go, da 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 And the choir's passed out because they can't breathe. They can't do anything. It's just going on and on. We breathe at cadences. So there's a problem here in, in form. Bach had not rigid forms of, you know, four by four by four phrases like some other composers we know. But nonetheless, there was shape to this. The singers had to sing. Balance had to know how to shape these things and so forth. So for that... I devise a little extra part of the program. Instead of giving my own rules and creating a, an expert system for it, I had a new phrases built from models of Bach phrases. So on top you see a phrase by Bach. On the bottom you see a phrase by Emmy. And in fact, if you look at the top, you can see the, the actual little parts of it in the chorales that it came from. But notice, and I'll use my little pointer here so you can be sure I can be sure that you actually see what I'm getting at here. You'll notice that the first chords are precisely the same. And the last chords are precisely the same. Okay? So the program knows where it's starting. And it knows its destination. It knows a bit about going upwards and so forth. But it's, it, it is trying its best to create a, not duplicate, but a, but a sensible kind of uh, phrase following Bach's phrasal prim- principles. And, and it works nicely. If you see these little dotted lines under here, it means that each one of the objects that have been saved have been saved with information about their ensuing chords, their following chords, their cadence chords, and so forth. So they're chosen not randomly. That first phrase that I gave you turned out pretty good. It didn't have to, but it, it actually did by accident, so that's why I use it. But it didn't have to turn out that way. It could, could have turned out miserably like most of the rest of them did. But now we're, we're saving some information about the form and structure of the piece. So instead of choosing this next chord randomly because they had the right notes, now we choose this chord based on the fact that it was the second chord of a phrase of a Bach chorale someplace. And we put together a new phrase that's going to make sense. Let's play the Bach on top first, and you'll see if you think that fra- the second phrase makes sense. <laughs> the bottom one, the Emmy imitation with little pieces from all over the place. And of course, what really excited me about all this was the fact that I was not stuck with writing with a, with a little Bach creator. I could change the database. And when I got the call from the, from the guy about commissioner saying, God, it's been three and a half years. Where's my opera? And I don't have one stinking note of this piece done. I could say to him with all confidence, I am really close. Because all I've got to do is replace the Bach database with a Cope database. And now it's going to pop some Cope. But I'm not through yet. (laughs) Because Cope has got some form, like Bach corrals have form. So we have to go on and look at things like storing forms and modeling forms. So in essence, what's happening here, this is really structure, not form, but I won't go into the difference between those terms in this group, but to say that, as you can see, in fact, we can't even play these, it would take too long, but phrases are now related to phrases, so that these choices that are being made, once they've chosen the first chord, there's, there's almost going to be just one chorale that can be made, or just two or three that can be made off of one model of a Bach chorale because there's so few choices to be made, because the choices have to be made so intelligently in relationship to the form that's being reconstructed following Bach's model. Okay? Now, does this come out to be sounding like Bach? Well, I'll let you decide. You've decided already about the Chopin. So let's look at what I'm going to play now. This, this chorale was done in about 1987. By the way, the date of completion of the opera. which got the best reviews of any particular piece of mine that I've ever had. (laughs) Richmond, Virginia called it an American masterpiece. Written in two and a half days (laughs) with this program. (laughs) But I didn't tell them. (laughs) By then, I'd already had enough feedback, if you want to call it feedback, There's other names you can refer to it as uh, about this. But here's the piece. The words 
Yeah, the words. The lyrics, they came from a Bach cantata book that I had, and in the back it had a bunch of words in the Dover edition that I could use in German, and I just threw them in there. So if anybody knows German well, I apologize to you, to the country of Germany, to Bach, to anybody else who happens to be offended by this. The words were just thrown in there to fit, because I knew I wanted a choir to sing them. And so we're going to have a choir sing them tonight, not on stage so much, but it sort of will be on stage. But here's this, this Emmy Bach chorale, and we've been hearing this stuff uh, composed or, you know, performed, aside from Anatole's earlier performance, with this rigid mechanical sound. We're not going to hear it with the choir in 1989, two years after it was composed. And we're going to watch it as well, because this is a video. And in fact, I think I have uh, the video, video's maker, Bob Geigas. I would rather have the title be Bach Lives, and Bob knows that, but Bach Lives at David Cope's house it is, which would explain some very strange things that have been happening in my house ever since, but we'll not get into that here. Uh, and let's, let's see and hear this performance you might, those of you who've been around a while and been to performances, might recognize one or two people in this video, and you can actually, I don't know why I'm making a secret out of this, I just realized it's right on the screen in front of you. Nicole Paymont, who couldn't be here this evening, but right now is probably uh, uh, thinking strange thoughts about the fact that I told her this afternoon that she was going to be on screen this evening, 18 years younger. So we'll see how she feels about it, and here we go. Now, I suppose in a way to prove that the program actually does what it does, I decided that this evening we're going to hear a world premiere of another Bach chorale. And so uh, this is going to be composed on the spot by what I call Emmy Demo. And we're going to go to Emmy Demo right now. And hopefully, I've had to start Emmy Demo. Emmy Demo, which is kind of a portable version of Emmy, requires about two minutes to start up, and then it takes about 10 minutes to load the data. So I've done that in advance of this. Uh, in fact, I even composed a piece, or had the program compose a Bach chorale, just to test it previously to this. And so I hope it's still in working order, because this was all done a few hours ago in preparation for this presentation tonight. We'll see. Uh, if you're curious about how the program looks, you just load stuff, compose stuff, play stuff, look at stuff, save stuff. I like simple, straightforward things. <laughs> so we're just going to compose stuff. Now, I make no guarantees. This is about Corral, because I'm trying to keep this part of the presentation consistent with this particular type of, of, of process. 
Remember, the Bach chorales require very strict rules of voice leading and so forth. So in a way, it's hard to create Bach chorales. It's one of the hardest things to do. On the other hand, it's easy to do because we don't have to deal with some of the large scale structures of sonata allegro form and so forth. So you've got to realize that on the spot here, we're not going to deal with some major issues that I haven't explained how the program works with tonight. But it's, it, this is a good choice for us, I think. It's going to be performed mechanically because we don't have a choir here to do it and there's no lyrics. But let's give it a try and see what happens. And God, I hope it's good, but we'll see. It can compose many. In fact, on my website, there are 5,000 of these things. Brings up an interesting idea. Somebody is going to surely ask me, have I heard all 5,000? And the answer is, I've only heard one of them. It's all I needed to hear, that one of them was good. So there's 4,999 up there that I have no idea about. Okay? Now, I don't usually choose uh, forms of music that, and then compose or have any compose more than the composer him or herself did. For example, there are 56 Emmy mazurkas, just like there are arguably 56 uh, Chopin mazurkas. There are 98 preludes and fugues in Bach's Voltempered Clavier. There are 96 preludes and fugues in David Cope's slash Emmy's well-programmed clavier, <laughs> etc. But with Bach chorales, I didn't feel a problem in creating large numbers of them. I also wanted people to know what the consistency level is. You know, how, why I threw them away. Were they just a 4,999 really bad ones? And I just happened to luckily come across a good one? Or were they roughly the same equivalent value? Whatever value that might be. So we're going to find out. And I have no idea. But it says many there. I wanted to tell you what that was all about. So now we're going to see and hear. Oh, goodness. High for the Sopranos. things I could, I, could, uh, I would adjust if I was in the mood to do so, or compose a new one. Um, oh, let's do. That wasn't very good. Um, one more. Come on. Don't let me down. Come on. There we go. Thank you. 
Got some really nice spots in there, but I still wouldn't accept it. But, I didn't mean to yell at you, I'm sorry. Pretty consistent with what you heard sung live, even though still problematic. Um, I told you about Rachmaninoff earlier. Bach chorales don't have rests for the most part. They're just four voices. They go on and on and on. Most music we hear doesn't do that. Most music that we hear, classical, where my mind is anyway, has diversity of textures, has you know, two voices and three voices and eight voices and chords and not chords and so forth. In order to do that, the program has to not only remember all the things that I told you about that the chords had to remember in a Bach chorale, but they have to remember how they connect with the material that is next to them, the texture they live next to them. And they have to think about themes and their repetitions in compositions. So those objects I referred to very early in my presentation, that is a beat, now contains a humongous amount of information about where that piece was and where that beat was originally and how it can be used in future compositions. It's as if every composition in history bears in it the seeds of many, many more compositions. In fact, I maintain, arrogantly I've been told, but I still maintain that I think composers really do that, that we really are recomposing the past in many ways. We are, after all, what we hear, and that's what we produce. And that's what a style is, a tradition is. Okay? And I believe that Emmy is part of that tradition, even though it's mechanical. I'll leave that lay. I'd like to now introduce uh, two of my favorite people, Maria Azarova and Anatole Lakin, who are going to produce an example of this music in the style, arguably, of Rachmaninoff. And so we'll have them and their page turners come up. And I no longer wish to play a game with you. This sounds like Rachmaninoff, period. <laughs> it does. Whether you could tell the difference between the real thing or not is another thing. Whether it sounds too much like Rachmaninoff could be a question that we might entertain in some questions after I'm through. But I'd like to introduce them to play this sweet movement that was done in, I think, 1991, the first successful attempt at Rachmaninoff. While they're getting set up, I will say that very soon now, Rachmaninoff's Six Piano Concerto. I say six because he wrote four, but the, there's a set of variations in there that are often called his Fifth Concerto. And it will be out and available on recording, orchestra and piano. It's a bear of a piece to play. If you get me to do so, I might play part of it after we're through here today, but probably not. We're moving a tree now. It's a very... No, no, no. It's part of the Rachmaninoff style to begin by moving a tree before you play any of his pieces. <laughs> okay.
Bravo. So why did I create the 6,000 music compositions using experiments in musical intelligence? Well, I put down here a series of things that you can read, so I won't read them to you. There's some that are very serious, and I think the ones at the bottom frivolous aren't really that frivolous now that I look at them, because I had a great ride during the time that I did this. It was really fun to hear things come out crooked and weird, and then things come out pretty good. And, and I've had a, a good time doing it, as well as I've learned a lot most importantly, I think, is number two under Sirius, that of all the things that I did during this time is I learned to appreciate the music that I love better and more deeply, which relates to the first point there. I love to create debates as long as they remain intellectual and not physical, and I uh, feel I've done so. In fact, I know I've done so, and that's been kind of fun too. Why I no longer compose using this software? Well, the first line there is kind of confusing, but what I mean to say by that is that other than the Bach chorales, which takes 5,000 out of the mix immediately, the 1,000 works, including three grand operas and other things that I used Emmy to create in the 25 years that I've used this program, now published finally and available on the internet in various forms and recordings and written five books about, okay, I found that Performers often were very interested in playing these pieces, but something always changed their minds. Some very big name performers have written to me, called me, asked me to send me these things. They want to play them usually as an encore or something. But almost invariably they tell me their agents have talked them out of it or something else because it's not going to be a popular move to make or what have you. And finally, I started thinking that one of the reasons that some of this music, which I think is good, now I may be misled on that, but it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm still the arbitrator that I, that I consider important in this matter. And so the, the output that I think is, is good, I would like played. And given, and given more of the loving performances that you've heard here this evening by the choir and the two wonderful pianists that you've heard. And I wasn't getting that. And somebody finally told me, he said, the reason you're not getting that is because you have an eternal spigot of new music by these composers. Why should I play this particular Mozart sonata style piece when you're going to turn out 50 more tomorrow and 60 more than, you know, and one person actually told me, he said, there's a reason why in the, in the uh, Olympics we have a gold medal, a silver medal. And the reason why we have those and a bronze medal is because of the special rarity of those items. We prize rarity. So I killed Emmy. Well, I really didn't. That was too hard to do. I destroyed all the databases I had built. So I could keep on using Emmy for my own work, at least in part, and not do any historical compositions. That's all. And I've noticed already, since I've done that three years ago, that some performers are actually looking other than the ones that are my friends, are looking at these things a little more interestingly now because that's all there's going to be from this particular composer. And so it's, it's an interesting thing. So part of the reason I did it was that. Part of the reason is I didn't want to become known as the mechanical Vivaldi. I think you've all heard this line, and I don't agree with it, but that Vivaldi didn't write 500 concertos. He wrote one concerto 500 times. Right? I don't believe that. I happen to be a Vivaldi lover. And I listen to these pieces and I really can find unique aspects of them that make them really beautiful pieces. And I know all the cello concertos. I have them all in recording and I listen to them a lot and find them unique and wonderful. But there is something to be lost in a huge collection of, of compositions unless you're a Mozart, unless you're somebody who died very young and, and could create this miraculous amount of music in that time. So, uh, I'm still on that same subject. I'll skip it. Want to make te people make, take this work seriously? I do. Mostly I want to develop other of my ideas. Why I've turned to quite different but related research, Emily Howell. Emily is a, is a variation of the word Emmy. 
and Howell is my middle name, nice Welsh name. And I gave her that name, her, again, I'm anthropomorphizing a bit of my work, as a new way of composing. And this program has a different point of view. With this program, I'm attempting, through verbal communications, which I can do, and musical communications, to get it to write its or her own music in her own style. It is really like pulling teeth. It's hen's teeth or something. It's very difficult to do. So in the time I've had Emily Howell, six years now, I've only got three pieces out of her that are worth a damn at all. And there's some question about that. But they're definitely in her style, more or less contemporary, probably a little less right now, but getting that. And what's really fun about Emily Howell is she runs, at least in part, on the general principle again of what we call, or I call, data-driven computer programming. And that is, uh, it's programming which is a big database. And the only database that Emily Howell has is her mother's music, all 6,000 pieces of Emmy to work from. But instead of trying to get a style, a Bach, a Rachmaninoff, a Mozart, a Chopin, her job is to find a style of her own so that she can be a composer right up there with the best of contemporary composers. I doubt that's going to happen, but that's what I'm having fun working with. I take that back. That's what I'm working with. Sometimes it's not so much fun. Now, when I say world premiere of a new work, well, you've already had that to some extent. And I'm going a little bit over here now because I was supposed to stick with an hour. But I'm going to play one more piece here that's performed uh, on recording now, not live, because we couldn't do it for various reasons live tonight. But it's recording, and it's not quite a world premiere. We played it a couple of times in performances and didn't tell anybody about Emily Howell. And people really liked the music. And so I thought I'd play the third movement of one of these pieces. It's not great music yet, but you understand that my, my job with this program is to somehow massage it to create music of its own. Not music in my style, what I like, but distinctive music of its own. And it's coming kind of close at times. This is Opus 1 from Darkness Light. Um, and we're now going to hear uh, that movement. It's short but I hope you get a chance to listen. We, we can listen to it all, hope you stay, and then we can ask some questions and so forth. Here's a little bit of Emily Howell.
and give her a hand. I want to end by saying that um, I'm a recently, I'm a recent professor emeritus, having retired just this last spring. But I think I speak for all emeritus everywhere, at least I hope I do. My best work is ahead of me. Okay? This is where it starts. I also want to thank the performers again. I want to thank Dave Morrison back there for all of his help in making this all work. For Daniel Brown up here, who's been a great help to me. The page turners and everyone else involved in this, you've been wonderful. And now, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them either as a group or if you want to. I believe there's some light refreshments out there. There are refreshments out in the hall, but let's take a few questions um, first. And uh, I'll repeat the questions so that we have it on the recording. I see a hand back here. Yes. Yes. Okay, for, for my sake, keep the questions short, please. But yeah. <laughs> the question I believe would uh, be, how does Emmy compare to Band of the Box? And um, I didn't, I don't know. Did you get the rest of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I don't know if they did, but I did. Yeah. Okay. Band of the Box is kind of a rules-based or expert system, which uses a bit of original Charlie Parker, but it actually works in a, in a very different way than this program does. Um, you, you know, basically it's working, you know, style is an interesting thing. Sometimes in popular music in particular, we refer to a style as something which actually you lay down with a series of drum tracks, etc., cetera, and, and use a certain set of instruments to create. Um, whereas in classical music, it has to do with nuances of a lot of different things, harmony, counterpoint, melodic lines, and so forth, form, large-scale form, and so forth. Um, I don't know what he, he would feel about Band of the Box's versions of his music. I know that, in part, my program is not capable of doing very good quality jazz or pop music because jazz and pop music have a lot more to them than just the notes on paper. As you know, in fact, they often don't have notes on paper. And this program works exclusively with notes on paper. And so it did, for example, in the early days, a lot of Beatles tunes, which I thought were actually pretty good. But because the Beatles weren't singing them and there were no words to them and so forth, they just, when I played them for people, they just, <laughs> they just thought they were just stupid. And I agreed with them after a while, they were stupid. But, but you, know, when I, you know, if I could have found, and I couldn't, any Beatles song that had never, nobody's ever heard before, at least the people in the group, and played it in the, with the same restrictions that Emmy got, I thought they would probably have the same reaction. I don't know if I'm answering your question fully, <laughs> but I don't believe Emmy would be any good at what you just said. Band of the Box may be good. I know a little bit about it, but not a lot. I've heard enough to know that I don't want to hear a whole lot more about it, <laughs> frankly, okay? <laughs> All right. Any others? There's one up here. Yeah. No, no, I always, it depends. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. Oh, sure, I can't. Sorry. Uh, the title, From Darkness to Light, when did that get applied to this uh, composition? Was it after or before? It was probably during and probably had during. nothing to do with what I heard or what, what Emily Howell knew. She doesn't know anything about that, nor would she have any ability to be able to, to make it like that. Uh, I select, there are six movements to the piece, and I put them in a certain order. But I just thought for a first composition, it's, there's, there's in, in, in astronomy, a new telescope gets what's called first light. When the first time it actually, you open up the telescope and you have first light. And it's, you know, from darkness light was kind of like that. This is a, the, the birth. One of the early pieces in my style uh, that, that I had Emmy compose was called Vacuum Genesis. It's a great title, I thought so, but <laughs> what's it supposed to sound like? I don't know. <laughs> and, and I don't know exactly what from darkness light should sound like, but you're right, it does sort of sound like that. But there are five other movements that don't quite sound the same way. 
Uh, and, and so, but no, there, there, there was no relation, really. But then again, to be honest with you, there's no relationship a lot of times with, with you know, Concerto Number no. 26 for Piano and Orchestra by Mozart. Whoa. Yeah, it sounds like that. Well, yeah, I guess it does, because there's a lot of other concertos that sound with the same form, but it doesn't make much difference. Symphony Fantastique by Hector Berlioz. Now, that probably sounded like what he meant to sound like. That title sort of fits, and you put Symphony Number no. 1 on that, and I don't think it would have the same uh, feel for it, particularly since you know that he was a little bit... Uh, yeah, he, he uh, <laughs> smoked stuff uh, and other things. Thank you, Stan. Right. How does dynamics arise from the chordal right. prog progressions? And right. In the original days, uh, I didn't include dynamics, and that's one of the reasons I went to Bach chorales, because there are no dynamics. So it was easy not to have to worry about that problem. You worry the performers gave the dynamics, gave the loudness quality, the shapes of the music and so forth. So the performers who sang the Bach chorale here gave it the life you heard dynamically, phrasing-wise, rubato of tempos and so forth. Uh, as time went on, I was able to incorporate dynamics. But you can imagine, if you choose this chord from that piece and this chord from that piece, it's going to sound like a mess with the nemes being loud suddenly and soft suddenly, and it would just jerk around dynamically, just like it, you, you know, you think it might if, if you, these were random assortments of, of chords in a row. So what it had to do then was essentially take a phrase of approximately the same length of a piece by the same composer and model dynamics after that. So the, the dynamics are put in separately. They're not put in as a result of the recombinatory process. It's a process of looking at, you know, always using models to get these things. And so whenever the temptation was strong for me a lot of the time to, to put my own rules in this, because I know how a phrase should sound, and I know how I want it to sound, but I, I tried to avoid that and tried to use models of the composer at all times. There's one back here. Back here. Where can you Thank learn you, how to do this kind of programming? <laughs> this, is, this is a setup question. Yes, right. <laughs> yes. There is, we give a workshop, and I say we, it's Peter Elsie, <laughs> myself, and Paul Nauert give a workshop called the Workshop in Algorithmic Computer Music every summer for two weeks, right here in this building after the rest of the students have left. It's wonderful. It takes, it's like 16 hours a day for two and a half weeks. It's really tiring, but at the end of that time, you know how to program and you know a lot of the basics of the kinds of things that I'm doing here and other people do with algorithmic composition. So if you're curious about that, you can look on the summer school website. Sven, you want to give us the, <laughs> the actual HTTP colon colon backslash? Yeah, we're first on, you can imagine, the first WACM you'll come to. Although I think I checked it, there was some other Wacom. But that was a porn site, I'm sorry. That was a different, no, 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 no. <laughs> Think okay. about it. You'll get it about midnight. <clears throat> okay. I think we'll, we'll uh, stop here. Okay. And if you have some more questions, <laughs> <Put that line. laughs> you can ask. Thank you all for coming. If you, if you have any other questions you'd like to ask me, you can come down here come or down I'll come out there eventually. So and uh, enjoy refreshments talk. out in the lobby, please. Thank you Thank all for you. coming.